Hello, everyone. Welcome to this SNEA NSF webcast, Security of Data on NVMe over Fabrics, <laughs> the Armor Truck Way. I'm John Kim, your host for today's webcast, our moderator. And let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot of great content for you. So let's jump right into it. First, let me introduce today's presenters. So I'm John Kim, chair of the SNEA Networking Storage Forum, or NSF. And we have today for you, Claudio DeSanti from Dell Technologies, Nishant Loda from Marvell, Rishikesh Satwane from Samsung, and Eric Hibbard from Samsung as well. A panel of very knowledgeable experts here to help you understand different ways and better ways of securing your data on NVMe over fabrics. So, so to speak, I am driving this armored truck or armored bus uh, and where we're helping protect your data as you transmit it over the network. Before we get started, just a few facts about SNEA. So SNEA has over 180 industry leading organizations, more than 2,500 active contributing members and more than 50,000 uh, users and viewers of our content, IT end users, storage professionals and vendors worldwide. You can learn more about SNEA at SNEA.org slash technical or follow us on Twitter at SNEA. The Networking Storage Forum or NSF covers Ethernet, Fiber Channel, and Finiband, as well as networking protocols like iSCSI, NVMe over Fabrics, NFS, and SMB. Today's focus is NVMe over Fabrics. And we cover other types of networked and distributed storage technologies, as well as solutions like securing your data, which is what we're covering today. A brief legal disclaimer, the lawyers make us say this, so do pay attention just briefly. The material in this presentation is copyrighted by SNEA unless otherwise noted. Member companies and individual members may use this material, but it, as long as they agree not to, to use it in its entirety without modification and acknowledge the source as SNEA. Remember that neither the author nor moderator nor any of the presenters are attorneys and nothing in this presentation should be construed as legal advice. There are no warranties for this data. So that said, I think you'll find it very interesting and let's get started. Our first presenter with a storage security overview is Nishant Loda. Nishant, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, John. And I got to say, you haven't seen a better looking handsome security cards to protect your NVMe or Fabrics data and the John and the bus driven by John. So with that, um, I'm Nishant, a pleasure to be here with, uh, <clears throat> with such illustrious crew to talk about storage security. I'm gonna talk about and start off with a little bit of background and context here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being on a SNEA NSF webinar, which had hero numbers in its title. And uh, between me and Eric from Dell EMC and Rob Davis from NVIDIA, we talked a lot about what we expect and customers uh, to look at when they would choose a NVMe or Fabric. And uh, we discussed and made comparisons between uh, fiber channel and FC NVMe, NVMe over TCP, RDMA, InfiniBand and such. Uh, and those conversations talked about cost, uh, you know, how easy it is to deploy one fabric over another, what kind of performance you expect, uh, what applications are more centric to what kind of fabric and uh, what fabrics are scaled to what size uh, and how easy are they to deploy and manage at that size. Uh, there's one topic that we could not get into into detail was security and security while listed here towards the end is should not be and is not a afterthought for NVMe or Fabrics. It's a very critical piece of that. So we figured uh, we come back here with, with experts around security for NVMe or Fabrics, uh, both around fiber channel as well as ethernet based fabrics uh, and uh, you know uh, delve deeper into that. Uh, so this is your dedicated NVMe or fabric security session. If you want to go a little bit more from where this story started, uh, go back and look at the Hero Numbers uh, webinar, which I'm told is also available in the resources page. Uh, um, before we go any further, I do want to clarify one important thing here. There is sometimes we use data protection and data security interchangeably. The conversation today in, in this session is mostly speaking about data security, which to me is kind of measures that 
we and our customers take to protect the integrity of data, right? Uh, control it against unauthorized access and <laughs> give it access to people who deserve it, uh, while you know also protect it against uh, uh, accidental corruption or loss or things like that, uh, right? Uh, to me, um, whether you use encryption of data in flight that Claudio is going to talk about, uh, you know, or self-encryption drives for data at rest. Uh, um, Sorry, there's a little bit of noise coming. Can somebody go on mute who's not talking, please? Um, data security is both encryption in flight as well as encryption at rest. And we're going to talk about both of those things in this session. Uh, to me, data protection is about making sure you make copies of your data, disaster recovery, things like that. That is not generally the topic of conversation here. We're going to talk about data and storage security, which is primarily around encryption access control, a secure channel, and things like that. Uh, OK, so what are the different kind of data center security standards, uh, incidents, uh, events that have shaped the way we look at data security, and more specifically, NVMe or Fabrics security? Let's start with the graphic here on the left-hand side, right? I'm sure many of you guys remember like way back 2010, Google Aurora, where uh, source code repositories were out in the open and were uh, you know, uh, attacked and accessed uh, in those early days. I think not only Google, a bunch of different uh, other uh, you know, large entities were, were intruded on. There was the super micro hack of those chips that sat on, on these motherboards, which I don't think was ever confirmed. And then in 2018, there was the first you know, rootkit around UEFI, such low-level code that allowed uh, a malware like Lojax to intrude into your system. And there were, you know, everybody remembers from recent memory uh, events like uh, Spectre and Meltdown on the Intel processors that caused a lot of pain to our customers uh, uh, for all of these security vulnerabilities. And you know, these incidents, uh, there are several such incidents all around. Uh, uh, and they've always brought about a, a, a spate of security standards, right? For example, there was the self-encrypting drive standard with the PCG Opal. There was uh, uh, the OCP security, which uh, uh, Summit that, uh, you know, if I remember right, uh, uh, announced uh, the addition of uh, uh, Root of Trust, and uh, similar was the Google Open Titan. So, you know, a bunch of stuff. And then there has always been regulation, and FIPS and NIST have uh, kind of led the uh, led the boat on that. In fact, as recent as the NIST uh, SP800, in fact, uh, in detail talks about uh, um, uh, NVMe over fabrics and the need to secure NVMe over fabrics. So, uh, it, the, the key point here is that. Uh, over, over over many such large events with high visibility in terms of security incidents, uh, there has been a lot of work done around the standards bodies to get to a point where solutions uh, and technologies can help enable uh, data and security for NVMe or fabrics. And today's session will focus on, on two of these things, uh, primarily talk about TLS, uh, uh, for NVMe or Fabrics and uh, about fiber channel FCSP2 for FC NVMe. Uh, with that, let's look at uh, the chart here on the right hand side. And you know, from, from, from a data center perspective, there are a bunch of security considerations that we all uh, should be well aware of. So typically, our cell phone data is encrypted, at least when we are connected to our cellular networks. Uh, but oftentimes, data within the data center may not be encrypted while it is in flight. Although increasingly, we are seeing storage data at rest being encrypted. Uh, but it is imperative to understand that with shared infrastructures and new use cases, there is a need to make sure that uh, uh, data is encrypted even in flight. And that applies to uh, NVMe or fabrics, irrespective of the fabric you choose. Uh, right? Uh, Another important kind of entry point to your storage infrastructure is your devices, whether it's storage, the switch, uh, you know, the server with a NIC or a, a, a HPA. It's important to kind of implement hardware root of trust uh, uh, there that verifies the integrity of the firmware uh, uh, on those devices at boot, uh, you know, at uh, updates and things like that. Uh, so. Um, Several things to kind of focus on beyond just encryption in flight. Uh, 
uh, and encryption address to secure your uh, networks. Uh, but uh, one thing, and I, we used this graphic last time in the Hero Numbers webinar, but it's one thing that I wanted to use this graphic <coughs> to talk about is that when you when you look at storage fabrics, not every storage fabric and not every storage fabric use case need to be secured with the same vigor and rigor that others might need. And I hope to provide some perspective on that. For example, if you look at the extreme left-hand side here, if this was a, a small rack, uh, isolated rack, primarily doing deep learning, perhaps, uh, depending upon how sensitive your data is, perhaps you might not want to have uh, or pay the cost of encrypting all your data as it moved between these CPUs and GPUs to a storage arrays and back. And similar would be a scenario, for example, on the right bottom here, if there was a bunch of flash that was hanging off a storage controller, the fabric between the storage controller and the bunch of flash may or may not need to be encrypted with the same kind of rigor and rigor as you would, for example, for intra-rack traffic going over fiber channel, TCP, or Rocky, or traffic going between data centers, typically over NVMe, over TCP. Those, to me, are much larger exposure areas, either a full rack, a shared environment, going across racks, or going across data centers, which definitely need to, uh, to implement a, a, a standard of storage security. Okay, uh, Sean, Sean that, let me interrupt for just a second. I just like, we have please. a question complaining about noise. Can I just ask uh, Rishikesh, Eric, and uh, and uh, Mar um, Claudio to uh, mute your microphones, and then I'll, we'll just remind you to go back off mute uh, when you, it's your turn to present. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Nishant, please continue. Oh, thank you, John, that helps a lot. Um, uh, perfect. Um, so uh, when we look at different drivers for storage security, you know, uh, we looked at often incidents of exposure uh, and hacks lead a lot of CTOs uh, uh, and CIOs to start thinking about storage security. But there has been kind of some verticals, whether it's healthcare, finance, defense, government, uh, I should add insurance to the mix uh, here, which are very kind of uh, sensitive verticals and often whether driven by regulation, for example, you know, the healthcare as well as the insurance industry driven by HIPAA and then broadly all the industries driven by the EU's GDPR or from a from ISO standards perspective, uh, the 27K1, they're all driving the need for storage security. And the, uh, as more and more fabrics transition towards NVMe and NVMe or fabrics, the concepts uh, uh, need to apply to to uh, NVMe or fabrics. Right? Uh, you know, traditionally, fabrics like fiber channel, for example, were typically air-gapped network uh, where uh, then it was okay to transact in clear text. But uh, you know, as uh, as fabrics uh, are used for multi-tenancy, where different customers share the same fabric, or for TR cloud storage. And even you know, none of us has probably forgotten the the Snowden era where there was malicious insiders. There is it is imperative to uh, to secure your data uh, in transit and at rest uh, and make sure that uh, you know it is uh, it is protected, uh, so to speak. Uh, and all of this requires you know what our industry calls it as a zero trust framework. Uh, and you know, um, often this does require investment in advanced technologies. And hence the, the kind of the reason why I'm harping on this is that when you go and choose your next NVMe or fabrics investment, uh, that would be a good time to ask the questions around, hey, uh, what is the storage security that uh, the products that I'm choosing for my data center provide? Because uh, uh, it, is a, it is a critical piece of your infrastructure. Um, before I hand it off to Claudio to talk about, uh, from a standards perspective, the work that uh, that Claudio and many others have done around securing NVMe or fabrics, uh, um, let me quickly uh, try and scare you a little bit, so to speak, right? Uh, in terms of a bunch of different security threats that uh, that are around us, especially especially around storage fabrics. Uh, you know, we've all heard of uh, you know, sniffing and man in the middle kind of. Uh, attacks, whether it's passive or active taps or analyzers, uh, these devices and uh, malicious people are uh, 
easily able to kind of look at metadata, look at data, and do attacks like replay attacks, uh, you know, denying you access to your own data. And they could use many of this metadata information to actually do mimic real storage and do uh, storage masquerading where they would uh, you know, insert a device uh, uh, a namespace or a LUN into your network, uh, which will look like a real one and uh, steal your data or words corrupt your own data. And certainly ransomware, if you have been on the East Coast in the last few days and lining up to get gas because uh, the colonial pipeline has been, uh, you know, um, under ransomware and uh, it's going to be shut down for a week and uh, stuff like that, you're, it's pretty clear that ransomware is a huge threat uh, uh, to us and our, our 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 infrastructure, not just energy infrastructure, but all infrastructures. So uh, very well understood there. And then there's a session hijacking where somebody could you know, bring a rogue switch or uh, you know, hijack individual sessions and steal your data. Um, and all of this, it is imperative that depending upon what use case you are looking at, it is imperative to implement some level of uh, authentication and encryption of our NVMe or fabrics. Um, uh, with that, uh, I think it's time to transition this to uh, Claudio and uh, uh, he'll talk in detail about the standards and the technologies that uh, are available for us. Uh, okay, thank you, Nishir. Yeah, thank you. So let's uh, move on. Let's do to, uh, to introduce the concept of which security mechanism we have available. Let's see among the main storage and network technologies, iSCSI, Fiber Channel, and NVMe over Fabrics, uh, which uh, specific security mechanism has been defined and how they achieve uh, the security we want. Uh, two main mechanisms have been defined for all these technologies. One is storage endpoint authentication, which means the two endpoints that need to exchange data, they authenticate each other. And so you know that uh, Alice is talking with uh, Tom, and Tom is talking with Alice, and Alice is verified, and Tom is verified. Okay, that is great. Um, but once you authenticate, your traffic in the middle continues to be in the clear. It is a first level of security, depending on the threat risks that your environment can have, that is considered to be fairly effective for most storage area networks. Well, that tends to be fairly closed environment. If you want to look at your storage area network instead as a totally open environment, you need to go to secure channel technology, in which instead you encrypt and you verify each payload, each packet that is exchanged between the two endpoints, and you apply cryptography in integrity. And so you verify that nothing has been altered in transit, and you encrypt the content, so you verify that no one, you ensure that no one can read what has been what is being transmitted. So, these are the two main technologies for securing data in flight. You do just authentication of the endpoints, or you establish a secure channel that guarantees that each packet that is exchanged is secure. In the iSCSI world, from let's begin with storage and point authentication. The iSCSI world defined the two uh, mechanisms, two protocol for authentication of the endpoints. One was plain chap. Challenger Shake protocol and using strong secret as the credential that enable to verify the authentication. And uh, SRP, Secure Remote Password, was the other mechanism based on weak secret. This in reality has never been used in practice. Fiber Channel defined a comprehensive set of security protocols for authentication in the FCSP2 standard. And uh, the one that is uh, mostly used, that, that has been actually implemented, has been the HAP, which is uh, a augmentation of the CHAP protocol with a Diffie-Hellman exchange that uh, enable to strengthen the protocol itself. Other authentication protocol that has been defined in FCSP2 has been FCAP from password authentication protocol, which is SRP-based. Or we have FCAP, which is based on certificates, or FCEAP, extensible authentication protocol that uh, still based on strong secret and enable to support a variety of uh, uh, variety of authentication schemes, 
Still, uh, this is what has been defined in the standard, what has been implemented to date is really the DH app, actually in most cases uh, without the DH exchange, so in a similar fashion to the SCSI way. For NVMe over fabrics, which is the focus of this point, what has been defined is DH HMATCH app, the third iteration of the CHAP protocol, in which that has been further augmented in terms of security properties, because not only it uses a Diffie-Hellman exchange, but also use an HMAX function rather than a simple hash function in order to perform the computation. So let's look at an example. How would happen uh, authentication be on, a, on NVMe authentication example within a host and a controller? Consider the example of a TCP. First, you will have a TCP session that is established, then NVMe, OF perform a connect command and that comes back with a connect response capsule. And the connect is uh, performed in order to set up the NVMe queue between the host and controller and associate the queue entities there also the controller. Now it is, is the point in which an authentication transaction can be performed. And so the controller can authenticate the host. Oh, you are claiming to be Claudio. Yes, you are really Claudio. Verify your identity card. And, and the host can do the same. You are the controller. Oh, you are claiming to be Nishant. Yes, you are really Nishant. Okay, good. And if the authentication is not successful, you are not being able to move forward with the protocol. Very similar to the main place where you, that you may experience uh, access control, uh, which is the immigration line when you enter to the United States, in which uh, your identity will be verified through your passport. And uh, if your identity is verified and you are fine, you will be granted access, otherwise not. That's fundamentally the same concept here. You verify your identity, and then if your identity is verified, okay, now you can access the controller. The, the queue entities are set up. So the queue will be ready for subsequent operations. Um, so let's go to some details of the DHH matchup protocol. It is defined in uh, technical proposal 8006. Is based on keys that needs to be different for each and QN, but basically are big random numbers. It's a challenge response protocol, and so fundamentally the authentic errors are a challenge. See the responder computer response, which is a hash of the challenge with the key of the responder and other things. And then the authenticator verifies the response. Or if there is an authentication infrastructure in place, something similar to a radius system can delegate the verification. As I say, the HMA chap is a strengthening version of CHAP because uh, there is a, on top of the basic CHAP protocol, it has been added a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to frustrate eavesdropper and use a hash mark function so a secure hash twice in order to improve the security of the overall protocol. And this protocol allows to achieve bidirectional authentication, although the CHAP protocol in itself is a unidirectional authentication. Let's go into a little bit more gory detail. How an authentication transaction would operate between a host and a controller. The host will begin the transaction by saying an out negotiate command that carries the transaction ID, a flag that identifies if we wanted to concatenate a secure channel to this authentication transaction, specifies which authentication protocol is uh, to be used. We define only one for the moment, the HF matchup. So that is what we is, uh, this is defined, it is describing. And then we'll have a list of potential hash functions and a list of potential DA, if the Hellman groups that can be used. The controller will select the hash function and the DFM group to use for the authentication transaction. And at this point, the controller will send a challenge, challenge C1 in a DHI matchup challenge message, in which says, okay, we will use for the transaction the, this hash, this DFM group, and this is my challenge in a Diffie-Hellman exponential, and also a sequence number. The host then compute the response R1 as an H mark using the key KH, which is the key of the host, of C1 concatenated to other things. This response comes back in a reply message. You see the R1 and the 
controller verifies this response. Basically, what the controller does, it computes an R1 prime and verifies if it matches the received R1. The same thing happens in the other direction. On the reply, the host can send a challenge to the controller, which means saying, OK, I want to authenticate you. And the controller then has to compute a response, which works exactly the same way. The response is sent back on the success message, assuming the first authentication was successful. And at this point, the host will be able to verify the response of the controller and therefore authenticate also the controller. And this is the full mathematics behind what is happening. Without entering the detail of what is happening here, I like to note that uh, in respect to the normal chap in which you send a challenge and you compute just a response based on the challenge, many parameters are included in here in computing the response, including the two identities. Oh, so the NQN of the host and the NQN of the controller, the two identities of the entities that are being authenticated. And this is done because uh, in this DDH and matchup protocol, Host and controller are, are configured provisioned with one single secret. And then they use this secret to authenticate any other entity in the fabric. And so they need, there has to be a way to tie this uh, spe a specific authentication transaction to the two identities that are being authenticated. That is the way. The identities are included in the computation of the response of the protocol. So, with this, we went through some of the details of the HMI chat. Let's go back to our uh, table that compares the various security mechanisms and look now at which technology has been used in terms of secure channel. So on secure channel, ISCASI defined IPsec, so, and uh, most of the usage has been in security gateways. Cyber channel, FCSPQ, actually FC, uh, uh, FS, uh, framing signaling, FSQ, defining the ESP header. That is uh, uh, IPsec-like optional header of other channel that enable to provide integrity and of, uh, verify integrity of a fiber channel frame and encrypt its content, which is modeled over IPsec. And FCSPQ defines how to use this ESP header. In terms of uh, and then our fabrics, which is the focus of the discussion. IPsec is an option because, you know, we are going over IP, so you can always put an IPsec gateway somewhere in your network between the two endpoints and get the traffic encrypted over there. But for the specific case of NVMe TCP, in order to perform, to ensure an end-to-end -end secure channel, what has been defined is the usage of TLS, for PCP based on pre-share key. So, TLS, it transport layer security, is a widely used secure channel protocol. Today, every time, as an example, this talk is running over TLS. Everything you are receiving is based on a TLS connection. Every time you do a Google search right now, every Google search goes over TLS. Most of the websites that you can go right now or whenever you browse the internet are using TLS as the secure protocol because this provides authentication with two endpoints, confidentiality and cryptographic integrity. So it's a very handy set of security features that you achieve by using these end-to-end -end security protocols. TLS 1.0, there are multiple versions of TLS, TLS 1.0 and 1.1, actually they're not anymore obsolete, ITF recently deprecated them, they shall not be used, their the security properties are not enough for current threats. The current baseline TLS version widely implemented and used is TLS 1.2, but is uh, getting replaced by TLS 1.3 at a very fast pace. Right now, if you look at the usage on the internet, we are almost 50-50 with TLS 1.3 getting over TLS 1.2. TLS 1.3 is a new version, is the latest and greatest TLS version, which is a complete protocol redesign, actually. We could, we could call it TLS 2.0 in practice and the usage is rolling out. Support is available right now in basically most of the security libraries. And so NVMe 
TCP completed in technical pro proposal 8011 the usage of TLS 1.3, which is not specified for other IP based protocols that don't use TCP, but is specified for the TCP transport. Um, TLS 1.2 was actually specified by an older revision on the NVMe over fabric standard, NVMe OF 1.1, and this has been, we tried to deprecate it, we came out with just a strong discouragement by TP8011, not only because the security properties of, a, of TLS 1.2 are not as good of TLS 1.3, but also because implementation of TLS 1.2 appears to have a limit on the maximum size an identity can have. The identity for a TLS transport is, uh, uh, for NVMe over TCP, is uh, the concatenation of the two NQNs of the two entities that are being secured. An NQN can be up to 224 bytes. You concatenate two, you go to 448 with a space in the middle, 449 bytes. It does not fit in the maximum size that is supported in most of TLS 1.2 implementation for an identity, which is 127 bytes. So translated, trying to implement what is specified in NVMe OF 1.1 for security actually would not. That is the reason why TP8011 strongly discouraged the use of a T, uh, TLS 1.2 and went straight for TLS 1.3, where this issue does not exist. So why TLS 1.3? Despite what I just said, when you look at TLS 1.2, IANA TLS Air Registry has more than 300 cipher switch code points for TLS 1.2 which means there are uncertain security properties, difficult interoperability. There are companies that are basically providing services to you. Oh, we resolve your security problem because we can, we can sort out everything about these 300 software suites code points. Not only that, but encryption starts late in the handshake. And so there is kind of a poor privacy. And given the age of TLS 1.2, there are also many features of TLS 1.2 that are known, that have known security. TLS 1.3 defines five cipher suites, all with perfect forward, forward secrecy and modern algorithm, guaranteed consistent security properties. Encryption starts as early as possible, hiding also the length of content, and so there is the minimal set of user information is visible in, in the network, and all the features that have uh, some known security flaws are omitted from 1.3. How does it work? A secure channel in the context of an NVMe TCP session. First, you begin rather than establishing the connection from host to controller using TCP, straight TCP, you do that using a TCP, a TLS over TCP secure channel established in a similar way in which your browser, when you do a Google search, establish a TLS channel between your machine and the Google server so that you can have your Google search perform and you get your data secured from eavesdroppers. And after you have this secure channel established, you will have the connector change to set up the NVMe queue and associate the host with the controller, and now you are ready. Your, the queue is set up, the host is associated with the controller, and there, you, as, there is a secure channel that is uh, passing the data between host and controller. What is the issue that TLS 1.3 has? It's all about the credentials, because a secure channel for NVMe TSAP is based on pre-shared keys. We don't use certificates. And uh, so in order to authenticate and establish a secure channel between themselves, uh, two NVMe entities need to be configured with the same PSK. The proper way to do that is that each pair of entity in a fabric need to have their own PSK. But if you have, a, but this means that this become an N square problem. You need to configure and securely provision and maintain a quadratic number of secrets in your fabric, which is difficult to get there. The problem that is happening is that any time this PSK has been used, often in the history, brand to a led to a deployment option called group PSK, in which everywhere the same PSK is configured. 
And this is a big security concern because now if one single node is compromised, you know, an attacker can access all the secure channel of the fabric because everyone is using the same secret. So this is the fundamental problem that uh, credential problem that TLS has. So what we defined in, uh, in TP8006 or NVMeOF is that the authentication protocol can actually resolve this problem. Because uh, upon completion, on a successful completion of authentication exchange, the two involved NVMe entities can generate a shared session key, basically a PSK computed on the fly, using the Diffie-Hellman exchange between host and controller. Now that you have the shared session key, it is possible to compute on the fly. Uh, once you have this PSK computed on the fly, you can use that one in order to perform your TLS negotiation. This is something that is used uh, in, for example, in SMTP and is called in literature opportunistic TLS. So what happens is that your TCP connection begins unsecured, then you perform an authentication transaction, and then the TCP connection transitions to become a TLS connection, and so becomes secure, as is explained here. So we establish a TCP session, we have our connect command in order to set up the queues and associate the host to the controller. The authentication transaction generates a PSK, and now the, this PSK is used to establish a TLS secure channel between host and controller, and now the secure channel is set, the queue is set up. What do we achieve by this concatenation of security protocols and authentication plus TLS establishment? We achieve uh, the fact that we need only a single set of credentials to provision in the fabric. And that single set of credentials is one secret per entity, is not associated with a pair of entities, but is associated just to the entity we are considering. So it is a linear program rather than a quadratic problem. And with this, I think I'm ready to pass to Shrikesh and Eric. Hello. Uh, this is Shrikesh. I'm a director of product planning at Samsung Semiconductors. I am finding team, which means I focus on innovation, new products, new concepts, and see how I can uh, build an internet uh, innovation. So today, uh, I'm excited to bring you one such new uh, technology called Ethernet SSD, or in short, eSSD. My colleague and a well-known security expert, Eric, is also joining me later in the presentation, and he'll be covering the security aspects. Um, to focus on NVMe over fabrics. And there are many ways to implement this architecture. Um, I have broadly classified them into three different architectures, as you can see. And uh, our focus. Hello, everyone. We're having some minor audio problems. We can't hear uh, Rishikesh right now. Uh, okay. Eric, is a Rishikesh, is that you? Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know who muted me. <laughs> okay, please, please go on. But if, you, if, you, uh, if we lose you again, we'll ask Eric to take over your these slides. Sure. So uh, I'll start explaining this slide again. Um, uh, our today's uh, webcast is focused on NVMe or Fabrics. And there are many ways to implement this architecture, but I'm dividing, classifying them into three types, as you can see here. Um, my, the focus for my part will be on the rightmost architecture with eBOFs. Uh, but before I go there, let's understand the other two. So we have a good sense of uh, what are the uh, you know, problems we are trying to solve and why we need to go to the uh, eBOF-based architecture. So the leftmost one is the easiest implementation of NVMe or Fabrics. Uh, the only thing here that changes uh, from the earlier ISCSI-based architecture is this NVMe over Fabric network and anything that uh, directly connects to it. So NVMe over bridge and other things. 
Um, now, the, the reason why we are going away from this architecture is the x86 processor and, and a lot of other things uh, that it brings together with it. Uh, you know, those uh, processors cost a lot of money and that's why there is a motivation to reduce the bomb cost and go on to the next architecture, which is smart NIC based architecture. Now, when we have gone from iSCSI to NVMe over fabric based network, we get an average of 2.4 times uh, boost in, in the, uh, the latency. And this was covered in one of the previous presentations. And that would be true for all three of these architectures, all the NVMe over fabric architectures. Now let's go to the middle one. Uh, this replaces the processor and all that uh, with an ARM-based uh, processor. So definitely there are some savings here. Uh, however, both of these architectures still have a limitation. There is a bottleneck. Uh, the bottleneck is in the bandwidth uh, that goes to the network. It's about 100 or maybe 200 uh, GPE. And as we move towards the right, um, that's what uh, we are solving here. And again, if you're eliminating some processing uh, in the box, in the EBOF, uh, it comes with its own challenges. Now we have to figure out where are we going to move all the storage functions, and we'll talk about it uh, in the next slides. Um, so uh, before we talk about that, uh, let me just give you a little sense of where the market is. Uh, NVMe or Fabric and ESSDs are like the new kids on the block. They are still uh, new technologies and a lot of things need to happen for them to become mainstream. Uh, now, as the technology goes uh, forward on these curve, there's a part which is called perfect disillusionment where a lot of people, uh, a lot of technologies die and they never get commercialized. But I believe strongly that both of these NVMe or Fabric as well as ESSD will survive all of that and move into this pl plateau of productivity and become mainstream. Uh, it'll take some time, but that's what I strongly believe will happen. Now, because they are in early part of their adoption, a lot of things are still getting figured out, um, use cases, security aspects and all that, and we'll talk about it later. So coming back to the architectures, um, to make things even simpler, I've reduced uh, the three architectures down to two so we can easily compare and contrast. Um, uh, this is the non-high availability version of the architectures and I will cover the high availability one in the next slide. So here you will see that on the left side we are moving away from the processor, the PCI switch, and the DRAM, and replacing all that with the Ethernet switch. Whereas the NIC gets split into multiple parts and is absorbed by the ESSB. Now, before, the processor were not, was not just doing a protocol conversion from <laughs> Ethernet to the SSDs, uh, but it was also doing some storage uh, uh, functions. And now we need to figure out where those storage functions will go. Now we have three options or maybe more options. Um, some of the storage functionality can be absorbed in these compute nodes or host servers. Maybe ethernet switch can get smarter and take on some of that storage functionality. And third, the ESSDs themselves can uh, add some more processing and do some of the storage functionality. Now, it doesn't have to be either or, it can be a combination of that. And the industry is trying to figure out what is the optimal balance at this point. Now, this is the high availability version of the previous two architectures, same benefits and uh, same advantages and compromises that I talked about. Um, uh, it just enables you to have uh, two of each component. So in case one goes bad, the other can take over and you have greater reliability. 
Now let's look at these even more closely. Uh, I could not make a vertical chart, so this is a little bit of rotated version, like clockwise 90 degrees uh, of what we saw before. Uh, I have elaborated more on uh, what the left side looks like in various applications. So before I just had a compute node, but there is a there is more details there uh, depending on the use case. And uh, you have a computer host node. Uh, there could be a storage controller. There could be a discovery server. Uh, in some cases, the compute node directly connects to the fabric and to the TOR and to the storage boxes on the right. Uh, in some cases, the compute node will first go to the storage controller, which in turn connects to the network fabrics and so on and so forth. Now, you know, uh, if you look at the right portion, the upper part is the PCIe based storage enclosure and then the lower <coughs> is the based storage enclosure what we call uh, you know with the ESSDs. Uh, here the bandwidth choking problem is very clear. Um, I'm giving an example with PCIe Gen 3 24 SSDs. You get higher than 700 GBE of bandwidth but by the time it comes out of the box out of the NIC it's constrained by the switch, the PCI switch, the x86, because there are some memory related bottlenecks and the NIC itself. On the lower side, um, if I take uh, ESSD, a single port ESSD with 25 GBE port, a 24 of those will give you 600 GBE bandwidth. And we have a lot of switch options, commodity switch options today that can handle all of this and push it outside. Uh, of the box. So the bandwidth problem is gone. Now, bandwidth is not just bandwidth. It also improves other performances. It has impact on other performance metrics as well. Now, you might ask, why do we need so much bandwidth? You know, most of the applications in the past need this uh, high bandwidth. And uh, the motivation is, uh, two ways. One is some of the new applications and second is disaggregation. So some of the new applications that are demanding such high bandwidths are AI ML um, applications, there's media related applications, and there is a lot of analytics and uh, those kind of new applications. The second is disaggregation. Uh, in, the, in the ethernet uh, world, it's easier to set up a network where each of these boxes can connect to multiple compute nodes and each compute node can connect to multiple of these boxes, you know, enabling true disaggregation across different boxes. And of course, there are security challenges to that, but what happens is if a particular compute node needs data from multiple of these boxes, it's easier to do that. At the same time, the same box can provide data to multiple compute nodes, and that's where the higher band, uh, bandwidth can be really helpful. Now, clearly, uh, as I mentioned, there are security implications to this new architecture. Before, um, the 86 was you know, uh, a sort of uh, shield uh, between the data that's residing on the SSDs and, uh, and the rest of the world uh, outside TOR. But now, uh, we just have a switch. And you know, uh, now people are afraid that, OK, then what happens? Uh, am I, am I, is my ESSD data completely exposed to the world and all that? So to dig deeper into all those aspects, uh, let me invite our security expert, my colleague, Eric Hibbert. Eric, please take over. Thank you, Rishi. Um, so security is, uh, has long been an issue with uh, the storage technology. Um, and uh, I, I must say, as a practicing security professional, I'm quite intrigued with what I'm seeing with, with efforts around the NVMe over fabric and, and some of the newer, newer technologies. Um, you know, for example, uh, when, when Claudio was talking about uh, essentially link encryption or, or protecting the data in flight, and, and you see in the, in the, the diagram, I've, I've added a few lines here, basically showing that um, from a security perspective, 
we, in this new technology, um, the promising elements, because some of the specifications are, are a work in progress, others are actually um, specified and we'll, we'll be seeing how the vendor adoption goes, but we have the potential of having pretty good coverage on, on data as it's moving through these fabrics between servers and, um, and the, the actual storage, all the way down to individual devices. So in, in the past, I, I often worried about um, storage arrays, for example, but now we're actually talking about being able to get all the way down to maybe a, a, an SSD in, you know, using the ESSD as, a, as an example, all the way down to that. We have some other things that are also quite interesting. These um, hardware roots of trust um, may actually give us some protections in the future against things like ransomware. Uh, well, how, how is that possible? Well, you, you have the ability to, to essentially check to see, you know, within a device, um, whether anything has been, been compromised. Um, you have, and, and in fact, uh, preventions against the use of a device or systems encryption capability as a tool for things like ransomware. Um, we're looking at uh, setting up ecosystems, storage ecosystems, where there is attestation possible between all of the devices that are interconnected. So, you know, a server can basically uh, reach out and, and check to see if everything that's supposed to be connected is connected and that those things that are connected are in fact, um, have, have essentially not had some sort of problem with uh, malicious firmware downloaded and things of those natures. Um, encryption. So not only do we have in-flight encryption, but a lot of these drives will have data rest encryption capabilities. This isn't necessarily new because um, we've had data rest encryption in, in drives and within storage arrays. But I think what you're likely to see in these new environments is that um, most or all of the media will, will be encrypted. Um, where, where it gets very interesting is where the key management is handled. Because if you look at um, where we are today with, for example, self-encrypting drives using um, TCG Opal, for example, uh, as, as the mechanism, well, the, basically the drive uh, handles its own keys and there's essentially an authentication process that, that allows for um, essentially an unwrapping of the keys inside of the drive. But with things like uh, Keeper IO, uh, which are, are being explored by both the NVMe community and the Trusted Computing Group, um, we could end up in a situation where the drive's encryption capability um, is, is being used. However, the keys may actually be injected into the drive. So the, the, the drive may not actually um, have its own uh, keys per se, but on an IO by IO basis, uh, we could uh, we could end up, uh, you know, as part of that transaction, um, you know, the key is is basically identified, and then the IO was performed, whether it's a write or or a read kind of operation. So this opens up some very interesting possibilities in terms of being able to uh, um, use the the encryption engine, if you will. On, uh, on a drive or maybe on a controller, but to uh, not actually have to worry about the uh, key management aspects you know, within, within that drive. And then that opens up opportunities for um, if you want to, to, to make data go away or if you want to uh, control data at, uh, you know, at an object level or a file level or user level, um, you, you have the ability to um, use different kinds of keys for uh, you know, at that sort of granularity, which is a much greater granularity than we typically use right right now. Um, the, there are also some uh, some activities to to again to guard against certain kinds of attacks, where um, you know a drive is put into a particular 
uh, you know, encryption's basically been activated and, and is operating, but, uh, um, you know, a, a smart attacker might be able to sort of roll back uh, the mechanism that you've got in place. And so their controls are being looked at in terms of how do you guard against uh, those kinds of attacks, which, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the, those that are operating in the ransomware space, that might be a form of attack where you know, as, as long as they deprive you of your data, you know, they've, they've won. Well, you know, we're, the industry is looking at opportunities to sort of protect against that. Um, so a lot of this work is being done in uh, multiple organizations, whether it's the Trusted Computing Group, NVMe Express, uh, Storage Network Industry Association, the Trusted Computing Group, the Open Compute Project, um, DMTF with its secure protocol and data model activities. Um, there's there's a, a, a large number of moving parts, um, all of which are contributing to various security components. And um, usually as a security person, you know, we're the wet blanket in terms of <laughs> trust but verify and, and all these intersection points are likely to be a problem. But I would say that, that from a storage security perspective, what we're seeing uh, and, and using you know, the ESSD as, as kind of an example, there are a lot of, of security uh, capabilities being specified, potentially being adopted by, uh, by the various vendors and essentially the consumers of this technology. And this could be extremely promising um, you know, in the future to, to basically secure storage infrastructures, which have long been a problem um, from, a, from a general ICT perspective. So um, with that, I think I will transition back to our moderator for some questions. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone. So that's a lot of great information. So we have just a few minutes and we do have a few questions. So let's see if we can get a few of those questions in and the rest of them will answer in an FAQ that we publish. All right. One question is how can we ensure the data is secured between the server and the front end? I assume that means the front end of the storage controller. Um, Eric, do you want to take that or Claudio? Sure, from, from a front end perspective, I think um, you know, this is back to, uh, at, at some level, the link encryption that we were talking about, whether that's you know, for fiber channel, you know, uh, some of the FCSP mechanisms or, or TLS or, or IPsec um, are likely to be the mechanisms of, of choice. Um, there, there, there may be some other options as well, but uh, those are the most likely uh, and I think Claudio did a pretty good job of covering uh, several of those. And okay. fundamentally, whenever you have these two entities, you want to secure the communication, they will generate a key on the flight that then they use to encrypt everything that is passed between themselves. Okay. That's how you feel secure. Okay, good. Right. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Eric. Here's another question. How can we stop the man in the middle attack in NVMe over fabrics? I assume there's multiple answers, but who, who wants to take that? I, I yeah, can I, go first. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Nishan. I just, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I, we can go into much more detail about all the different man in the middle attacks that could be, for example, in private channel, it could be polluting the name server, joining the fabric, and uh, I think if you, generally speaking, right, and don't take this as security or legal advice, like John said in the beginning, uh, but if you implement uh, good zoning practices uh, and uh, FCSP2 uh, authentication uh, mechanism, it can, you can disrupt most of these attacks. And uh, please, Claudio, add to that if you would like. Okay, Claudio? Well, from uh, an NVMe perspective, uh, man in the middle can be nasty. So just putting access control such as zoning or so on will not be able to stop them. The only way in which you can get to a full man in the middle avoidance is when you get to 
uh, really strong security protocols such as TLS. You perform a strong authentication of the two entities. You generate a session key, and then everything that since that moment on you exchange within those two entities is now protected by that session key. And so it's always you. No one can read what is coming out because everything is encrypted, and you have a strong e cryptographic integrity verification that I'm able to say no one touched or changed what has been passed in the slide. So this type of mechanism is uh, what enable end-to-end -end secure channel is uh, the way in which you resolve uh, most of these many individual attacks. Okay, so it sounds like to stop the man in the middle of the attack, we'd both want both uh, some kind of secure zoning or, ac or access control list. Plus, we also want a secure session key for each session that allows us to have in secure encrypted traffic uh, for each session that uses a key unique to that session. All right. Let's see. I think we can squeeze in one more question. We're going over just a little bit. And how does the NVMe disaggregated memory key management align with the PCIe or CXL consortium? confidential compute initiatives are they related are they or are they separate are they part of the same thing interesting question um there they are separate um however there are um, significant number of organizations companies and individuals who are actually operating in in uh in all of the uh organizations that are that are essentially operating in that space um, they may uh, result in in uh, uh, different options in terms of, of what you'll be able to do and I, I would say that, uh, that right now it's it's a bit of a work in progress but there is quite a bit of coordination that's taking place okay Eric very good all right so we still have several more questions but we are out of time so we've got so much great material the bus is uh the bus is, needs to stay on schedule and i think we've reached the destination but we will answer the rest of the questions uh in an faq that we publish or as a blog uh after this webcast so i'd like to thank all our great presenters and uh also thank everyone for attending this audience those of you who are interested, you can, audience members who uh, want to see the slides can download the slides, they are available. And we also ask that if possible, you give us a rating and your feedback on this session. So before you go, uh, tell us how we did and then give us feedback so we can make our webinars even better in the future. All right, well, again, thank you everyone. And that is the end of this webinar. We'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Oh, actually, Sorry, just uh, briefly, we do have a few more. I forgot to say, we have some additional webinars that are already recorded and available. Here are the links. So one on NVMe over Fabrics performance. Uh, then we have Geek Out on NVMe, which has multiple resources about NVMe over Fabrics, including this blog, NVMe over Fabrics for Absolute Beginners. And then, as I said, we ask you to rate this webcast, give us your feedback. And you can find the slides in the Kenya Educational Library, and we will publish the Q&A, uh, including the questions we didn't have time to get to today, as a blog. That said, again, thank you, everyone. And that concludes our webcast about security the armored truckway for NVMe over fabrics. This is your bus driver, John Kim, signing off. And we will go uh, park the bus and get everyone to their next destination. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.